Hi everyone, so today we're going to continue and talk about the last uh, of the experiments that eventually led to the development in quantum mechanics and that is the uh, set of experiment referred to as the double slit experiment in electron diffraction and then we're going to talk a little bit about something called the, the Broglie wavelength for uh, particle and we're also going to mention something called Heisenberg uncertainty principle while we're discussing these experiments. Okay. Let's get started. So we want to take off, uh, continue from uh, where we left off uh, a couple of concepts ago, which is when I talked about um, Einstein explanation for the photoelectric effect. Now, if you remember what uh, you know, Einstein said for the photoelectric effect was that in that particular context, light uh, actually behaves like a uh, a stream of particles as opposed to uh, waves, which is how light was understood to behave up till that point. So it was really revolutionary, this idea that light is actually composed of particles in that context. And that's the only way you can explain the photoelectric effect. So uh, coming off from that idea that light is basically a stream of particles, uh, Einstein then decided to derive a, an equation for the momentum of a photon. So momentum, for those of you who uh, have not taken physics, or if you've taken physics, you probably have seen this uh, concept before. It's basically a measure of how hard it is uh, for us to stop a particle. Uh, momentum for a, a particle, so it's a particle's property, okay, because it's defined with respect to a particle. Um, momentum is equal to, is a, has a given symbol P, and it's equal to the mass of that particle times its velocity. Okay, so this quantity here is basically a measure of how difficult it is for us to stop that particle once it's in motion. Um, and you can only have momentum if you're in motion. Now, if um, light is a particle, and which uh, according to Einstein it is, uh, in the photoelectric effect case, then these light particles or these photons should also have a momentum. So the question is, how do you how how do we calculate the momentum? Uh, what kind of equation can we use to to express the momentum of a photon of a light particle? Um, so Einstein basically derived an equation for the momentum of a photon. It's fairly straightforward. That's why I'm kind of listing it here. Uh, momentum, of course, is uh, mv, as I said earlier, mass times velocity. But that's also equal to if we're talking about light, then the velocity or speed is the speed of light, so it just becomes mc. Um, the energy of, of uh, light at that, uh, you know, there's this energy mass um, proportionality, which is E equals mc squared. This is, of course, an equation that a lot of you might have seen before. It's an equation that Einstein derived uh, from the theory of relativity. And so using these two equations, he basically relate uh, that with E equals mc squared, he can say that mass is equal to energy over c squared. That's just kind of doing a little mo movement here for the c to go down here. And then so we can write momentum p uh, equals to mc by substituting this expression as mass. So we put e over c squared times c. This One of the c's would cancel leaving us with just e over c. But remember that e of a um, of uh, a photon, right, energy of a photon is h times frequency, h nu, so then that's what we have on the numerator. And remember that speed of light is just a, a product of the wavelength times the frequency of that light, right? So then as you can see here, you have lambda nu at the bottom. The frequency terms cancel. You're left with momentum equals h over lambda. So that's Einstein's equation, and he said that the a light a uh, particle or a photon would have momentum that's equal to h over lambda. Now, once he proposed that, you know, uh, momentum, that, that a photon has momentum, then uh, people then, you know, had to go out and, and show, you have to have experimental proof that this is really the case, right? So the person who actually did the experimental proof was somebody called uh, Arthur Compton. And he tested Einstein hypothesis, uh, and this experiment is now, you know, famously known as the Compton scattering experiment. And Compton himself won the Nobel Prize in 1927. And again, this is going back to all the different people I've mentioned in this uh, topic so far. Every one of them has won the Nobel Prize either one way or another. Um, and 
what Compton did is basically he shot an X-ray, um, which is of course a wave, right? Because it's a it's a light uh, at a an electron that's uh, resting at rest. And what he uh, discovered was that when he shot that X-ray, the X-ray wavelength then changes uh, to another wavelength once it hits the electron. The electron then starts moving and that change in wavelength that uh, was observed for the x-ray is could be correlated to the change in the momentum of the uh, electron so basically the idea there is that it's sort of the x-ray uh, photon has its own momentum when it hits the electron some of that momentum is transferred to the electron and then the um, x-rays momentum uh, then uh, you know the original momentum then lost some part of it and then so it has a different wavelength as a result and going back to Einstein's formula you can you know if the wavelength changes then the momentum will also change as you can see here uh, so that's what happens in in this particular case and so um, he was able to then correlate the change in wavelength to the actual momentum of the uh, electron which uh, was considered a particle so then there's clear transfer of momentum from uh, something that was thought of as a wave, x-ray, to a particle, okay? And as a result, this basically is additional information or additional evidence or additional confirmation that light is in fact uh, a particle, okay? As well as a wave. We know that it's a wave, but now there has there's a couple of experiments to the photoelectric effect, the Compton scattering, that shows that the uh, light is actually also a particle. Now, coming off this uh, discovery, a guy by the name of Louis de Broly uh, decided that to, to take a look at this in a, in a different way. What he said is that, well, if particles, um, you know, uh, all particles, we know all particles have momentum. Now, Einstein just showed that light has momentum as well, but light also has, uh, behaves like waves, so light also has wavelengths, okay? As a result, he said, well, why don't I take this equation, P equals H over lambda, and rewrite it for a particle? In other words, what he's saying is that if, you know, light can have momentum, and it can also have wavelength, a particle, which we know have momentum, should also have wavelengths. And he could use Einstein equation for photon and apply it to a particle. So this is Einstein's equation, as I just showed you p is equal to h over lambda, this is for a photon, but now he's applying this to a particle. So he said that h over lambda is going to equal to momentum, which is mass times velocity. And then he solved this equation for lambda, which is just h over mv. And this is often called the de Broglie wavelength of the particle. So remember, now we're talking about particles here. So Einstein's equation earlier, when it was expressed this way, was for light, right, for a photon. Um, now we're talking about a particle, okay? So a particle is something that has a, a, a mass, right? A specific mass. It's moving at a certain velocity, okay? That's why it has that momentum. Now we're going to talk about the second part of his proposal later on, but uh, he basically says that, you know, if I have a ball, for example, then I can calculate its momentum, uh, uh, calculate its wavelength, I'm sorry, because it, it's going to have a certain mass and going to have a certain velocity. Now, once you have this equation, you can then go out and calculate the wavelength of any particle that uh, we see around us. We see a lot of particles around us, you know, a ball, a marble, a car, ourselves, right? All of us are particles, in effect. We have some mass, we're moving with some velocity. So let's do this calculation, in fact, with a couple of different particles here. And one is uh, a baseball that has a certain mass and it has a certain velocity. Uh, and another one is an electron with a, a, you know, a certain mass. We know the mass of the electron. We can find that out. And a certain velocity. Okay? Okay, so um, let's continue this calculation now in the scratch paper. So I just wrote down here the actual calculation that I'll be doing. The ball has a mass of 0.14, velocity is 25. We're just going to calculate the wavelength, and basically that means plugging it into the de Broglie equation for wavelength of a particle, which is h over mv. So h is Planck's constant, m is the mass, uh, v is the velocity. I want to point out a couple of things here. I expressed the mass in units of kilogram because 
Planck's constant has a unit of um, joule second and joules is kilogram meter square per second square so because I want to cancel my kilogram uh, that's why I express this unit at the bottom as kilogram and that makes it all uh, reasonable because then all the other units will cancel as well one of the meters would cancel leaving you with just a unit of meter and if you calculate this number you should get 1.89 times 10 to the minus 34 meter okay on the other hand if you were to plug in the same uh, e into the same equation but in this case using the mass of the electron instead which is um, 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 again this is a number you can obtain from an online source or from your textbook you'll find that your answer would be in the order of 7.27 times 10 to the minus 8 meter okay now I'm calculating these two wavelengths because I want to show you why it is that we don't really see wave properties for things like a baseball remember that all these time we always look at a baseball and we say it's a particle it has a mass it has velocity I can calculate where it's going using Newton's equation which is equations of a particle I never think of a ball as having wave-like property. I never think of a ball as being refracted, diffracted, interference pattern of a ball, and all those things. I never thought, I, you know, I would never ever imagine using those equations to calculate properties of a ball just because that's not the way a ball works in nature. However, uh, you can calculate this lambda, this wavelength for a ball, and now you have an explanation why a ball doesn't behave like a particle. If you think about this ball, 1.89 times 10 to the minus 34 meter, the wavelength is so small, so short, that's for all in, in comparison to the size of the ball itself. You know, if you think about the ball, at least it's going to have to be, you know, 10 centimeters in length, like a baseball. And this is just so short relative to the, to the size of the ball that it makes no sense to talk about this thing having even a wavelength. Now, on the other hand, when you're talking about the electron, you have this other number here. You know, about 7 times 10 to the minus 8 meter, about 72 nanometers. Now, that's a small number, but in comparison to the size of the electron, this is a big number because the electron is actually only on the order of about... 10 to the minus 12 meters okay so it's a fairly small particle but then the wavelength is very large so then you start to think that well okay if the wavelength is so large then the electron might behave like a wave okay and that's what and that's the other thing about it is that it's a measurable quantity it's so long that it's actually starting to be measurable something we can actually observe okay so going back here I want to kind of close off this video talk about uh, the conclusion of this is the question that people often ask of course once they have this method of calculating wavelength of a of a particle is well why can we ever see wave properties for a baseball okay why do we never think about them as waves the, the reason is because the, as we just did in the calculation the wavelength of something like a baseball is just so small that it makes no sense to consider the wave properties of this macroscopic objects but when you get to something really small like an atom or, a, or an electron that's when the wavelength becomes so large compared to the size of those objects that it makes more sense to think about those particles as waves okay and so the wave properties become a lot more important and a lot more apparent and something that we can actually observe